thank you very much for coming along again this evening. This evening we're going to look at a very interesting set of questions having to do with the history of cartography in the world, but specifically in Africa too. What we're interested in is what is it that conspired to create maps of Africa? It's not self-evident, right? There were a whole series of maps by Arab scholars and Arab researchers long before Europeans started to do work on Africa. But European cartography started to take Africa seriously in the middle of the 15th century. And in doing so, they started to take on a tradition of presenting Africa both on maps and in images in a way that's very revealing, not only about Africa, but about Europe itself. And that's what we want to look at here, the history of cartography in a sense in reference to it being an open book about European understandings of Africa and what was going on in Africa at the time. So we're going to take a look at what's um, called, in effect, a series of questions. What can we learn from old maps of Africa? We're going to be reading maps carefully for what is there, there in the map, and there supposedly on the ground, and what is not there. Maps reveal often a great deal about what is not there when they don't note something that is known to be there. And I'm calling this part one because we're going to start off with the royal moment, being that the moment in which the encounters between Africa and Europeans were largely between royal European expeditions, royal charter companies or royal explorers, to go look for specific things. Not necessarily in Africa, but about Africa as we'll see. All maps are, in fact, acts of human imagination. They don't exist as photographs. They long before photographs predated the idea of imagining something. And all maps, in a sense, are snapshots of a kind. But snapshots of what? Well, that's the question we have to start ask, asking and answering. What kind of picture are they? if they're a snapshot? The answer is complicated, but not difficult. In other words, there are several layers to it, but it's not mysterious. Maps are a kind of snapshot of the imagination of those who made them. This isn't very abstract. They have to be imagined, and they're imagined by map makers. Or, they're imagined for a map maker, by those who had them made. That's to say, we have to look at the structure of how the map is, in effect, created. Very few people had traveled to Africa, and yet they become map makers of Africa. And that whole process is something that deserves a lot of attention. So it's not just the imagination of the cartographer, the person who makes the map, but also of those who had them made, those who commissioned the map, those who paid for its development. The underlying question is whose imagination is being mapped? Is it the map maker? Or is it the person who's paying the map maker, informing the map maker, providing information to the map maker, and expecting a result from the map maker? First level question then is, what was the structure of map production in, in any given historical period? The structure of map production is crucial here because you've got to see who's actually doing the work, who's motivating the work, who's paying for it and the like. So you ask yourself the question, who paid the cartographers? The map producers. You could say the cartographers are the map producers, but that doesn't get you very far because who's employing them? Is it, as in the early cases in Africa, royal patronage that brings you into the realm of cartographers? Kings want maps drawn. 
That is a very interesting constraint in and of itself. What did those who paid the cartographer expect to see? Now, this is an important question because it determines, in some sense, what is going to be produced for them. If they don't see what they expect to see, they may dis be disappointed and may not want to continue with this particular cartographer. But we do have to ask the next question, what did they want to see? Not just expect to see, but what were they motivated, above all else, to want to see? Well, this leads to a very interesting set of secondary questions that we've got to pay attention to as well. What was the technology of map production at any given time? It's not just the motivation of the map producers, of the cartographers, or the map commissioners, shall we say, royal courts or gentry, but what was the technology of production? Well, this isn't straightforward and needs to be studied in detail because there are different technologies to produce a map. Yes, you can draw one, but there's a difference between a drawn map and a printed map. And what gets into the printed map that isn't in the drawn map? This is very interesting, actually. Is the map a hand-drawn one that is a manuscript map? If so, there are certain ways of studying manuscript maps that are different from printed maps. But if it is printed, how is it printed? What's the printing process? This isn't straightforward either because there's a history of printing behind all of this that needs to be explored. Was it printed from a wood engraving? An engraving on a flat surface of a piece of wood which held the ink when a sheet of paper was put over and, and then pressed to release that ink onto the paper? A wood engraving? Was it a copper plate engraving? Different technology, different substrate, different possibilities when you move from wood to copper. Or, later on, was it a steel plate engraving? What kinds of things can you do and are you expected to do on a steel plate that you can't do on a copper plate? And that you can do on a copper plate that you couldn't do in wood? All of this is very interesting by way of figuring out what the map means or says. What are the capabilities in effect and the limitations of each of these technical processes? Well, this is a very interesting set of questions to ask anybody who's looking at old maps. It leads to the third level of questioning, which is really quite a bit more complex because it has to do with the interaction between those two things. How did changes in the structure and technology of production change the character and the quality of the maps of Africa over time? Very interesting, because it's not just a straightforward case of maps getting better and better as people learn more and more, but it has to do with filtering it through the structure and those changes of structure of expectation as well as changes in the technology. Now, those two interact because different kinds of techniques are developed in respect to different sets of expectations. Very interesting interaction between technology and what might be called ideation not ideology, but the ideation of envisioning, imagining, and transcribing that imagination onto a surface. The ideation of the map may change because the structure of production has changed, that is the structure of patronage behind the map. It can then turn around and say, listen, we've got to develop a new technology to come up with what image is required. Now, the answer to this involves looking at the structure of European power and, in particular, the Mediterranean Sea in the late Middle Ages. You'll remember that the Mediterranean Sea was largely dominated by Christian powers in 600 AD.
but very quickly reversed. I mean, so quickly reversed, it's hard to imagine in modern times how quickly something can happen over this whole range of the world's surface, the Mediterranean. By 710 AD, as opposed to 600, so that's 110 years later, all of this green region is basically taken over by Arab concerns with the expansion of Islamic empires over the whole of North Africa. And very quickly thereafter, from 1710 to 1733, now that's only, <laughs> in effect, 23 years later, we've got not only the expansion of the green, but the intrusion of the green into the whole Iberian Peninsula, and in fact the control over what we call now Portuguese and Spanish uh, territory. This is really quite extraordinary. Very quickly, 23 years after 710, 710 is only 110 years after Christian dominance. Intrusion and in fact encirclement of the Mediterranean, meaning that anything that then flows and goes on the Mediterranean is subject to control of Arab ports, especially if it's going further to the east. Now, this is a big problem for Europeans because they have become aware of and very interested in trade with the east. And the Spanish and the Portuguese, in fact those on the entire peninsula, began to think about reconquering the peninsula. And this they engage in for a very long period of time. Take a look at this. We'll cut the sound in this because it doesn't do much, but look at the different dates and the periods in which there is a reconquista, a reconquering of the Iberian Peninsula by 1212. By 1250, they're down to that, and guess what happens in 1492? It's worth replaying that a bit, because something very quickly happens in 1492. The reconquista takes several hundred years, right? Here we're at 940, 1080, right? the green is being pushed further to the south as in 1160 these areas are again pushed further to the south and down here in 1212 AD 1250 AD 1492 now we begin to think of 1492 in the Americas as if it's the year that Columbus quote unquote discovered the new world he didn't discover it because it wasn't lost, but the question is, what happened to European history in 1492? Well, some say it looked out to the Atlantic, but that's not entirely true. In effect, what happened was, with the Reconquista of North, of the <coughs> peninsula here, the Gibraltar area totally under the control now of non-Arab sources, there came to be a focus on Africa in a brand new way that started to show up in the maps in 1492. From 1265 on to 1492, that last enclave of Arab control is ousted. Now during the years of the Mediterranean trade, the Venetians had come to don dominate the shipbuilding and seamanship in the Mediterranean. <clears throat> so even before the Reconquista, this began to change with the development of the Portuguese caravel. The Portuguese developed a ship which is very different from Venetian ships, and it was meant to be able to travel both within the Mediterranean and in the Atlantic. And if you look at the archaeology and, and even the art representation of these things, you can find that there's a shift towards this caravel structure. And it was particularly Henry the Navigator who put this in uh, in operation. Henry the Navigator was uh, the son of the King of, of Portugal. Let's take a look at it a bit. And at this time we'll turn the sound up. The great age of exploration began nearly 600 years ago in Europe. It lasted for three centuries 
and during this time, most of the world was explored by sailing ships. And new European settlements went up all over the world. And as a result, Europeans brought their way of life and their religion to much of the rest of the world. There is no doubt that the age of exploration was one of the most amazing times in history. But have you ever wondered how it all began? Around the year 1420, the king of Portugal's third son, Prince Henry, wanted to do something that would help his country become richer and more powerful. He wanted Portuguese explorers to be the first people to find a sea route from Europe around Africa to the far eastern parts of Asia, places such as China, India, and Japan. He believed that if the Portuguese could be the first to sail to Asia, then they could take the rich trade in Asian spices, porcelains, silks, and jewels away from their Muslim enemies, followers of the Islamic faith, who had been controlling that trade for hundreds of years. Back then, one of the main reasons no one had ever sailed around Africa to reach Asia was that sailors were afraid of what they might run into. They had heard stories that about one week's journey down the coast lay a sea of darkness filled with terrifying sea monsters, while other tales told of lands where strange creatures lived that were half human and half animal. Prince Henry decided that the best way to find out if these stories were true or not was to send a ship there. But before doing that, he knew his sailors would have to be very well prepared. That was why, around the year 1420, Prince Henry built a school of navigation on this rocky peninsula in southern Portugal. And well, that's the whole thing that is he here we have a son of a king, right? A royal building a school to educate mariners to go down the African coast with a brand new kind of ship, the caravel. And that caravel was the one that basically made the difference. Why? Well, because he had figured out how to use the sails and the keel to flop, sail right into the wind or close to it. As anyone knows from sailing, you can't go right into the wind, but you can tack against the wind and move down the coast of Africa when the wind is coming up. Very difficult at the time, but what happened in 1420 is that he started to map these coastal areas of Africa. Didn't know much about what went beyond these coastal areas. Had no idea what was here below. Um, but he began to give commissions, and in fact paid navigators to come back with maps of these western regions, which could be reached now that the Arabs had been pushed out of the Iberian Peninsula. So with the caravel moving down the coast, each year giving grants to explorers who could chart so many leagues of uncharted territory, we began to get maps that were really quite interesting, very detailed at first along both the North African and West African coasts. Europe is not their interest there, it's how to get around this part of the world. And these become very elaborate with details about river systems that are going to the interior, uh, representations of mountain ranges, and from the Arab sources, learning about what was going on over here, without any understanding that you could still go around the whole continent. But eventually, by 1513, with all of the commissioned work, he was able to get details on each one of the spots where his cartographers and mariners set foot, planted a stone saying the Portuguese had been here, and created very detailed maps, which he, they brought back to get paid by Prince Henry the Navigator. Now eventually, 
someone began to move out into the open ocean, and it was Vasco da Gamba. Take a look. Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama was the first person to successfully sail from Europe around Africa to Southeast Asia. Vasco da Gama was the one who opened up the maritime trade route between Europe and Asia. In my view, his going through the South Atlantic and around the Cape was equivalent to our putting a man on the moon. Born to a noble family in Sines, Portugal, around 1469, Vasco da Gama took to the sea at an early age. Vasco da Gama worked on merchant ships in the king's service, learning how to be a navigator, learning all of the things that he would later need to know in order to command an expedition. Da Gama earned a commission to find a sea route to India and set sail with a four-ship expedition in July 1497 from Lisbon down the coast of Africa. So the prevailing winds moved north, you're trying to sail south. Da Gama sailed out into the Atlantic basically almost as far as Brazil. Once there, da Gama was able to use the prevailing southern winds to take him south past Africa. What's historic about da Gama's voyage around the Cape of Good Hope is precisely that da Gama figured out how to do this. He is the first one successfully to get into the Indian Ocean, work his way up the coast of East Africa, and ultimately reach India. The Wano route from Europe to Asia was very important because it gave direct access to the spices of the Far East. Vasco da Gama is welcomed as a hero on his return to Lisbon to 1499 because the profits made from the goods that he had brought back from India demonstrated the wealth that could be achieved from this new route linking Portugal directly with Indian Ocean markets. Da Gama covered more than 24,000 miles in his historic trip to India and of the 170 original crew members, only 54 made it home alive. In 1502, King Manuel tapped da Gama to lead this larger expedition to again initiate trade directly between Portugal and the spice markets of India. This expedition from the Portuguese point of view is a success because da Gama is able to force his way into the markets and when I say force, I mean using cannons to literally blast his way into the harbor and force the rulers to trade with him. Upon da Gama's return to Portugal two years later, he retired from exploration and became King Manuel's advisor. However, in 1524, the new king, John III, persuaded him to return to India to become its viceroy. He died in India in 1538. Because Vasco da Gama found this route to India, he succeeded in making Portugal a principal supplier of high profit luxury commodities like pepper. High profit luxury commodities. It's the high value to weight ratio items that in effect created the Portuguese seaborne empire. And they were under the same king as Spain until 1640 and in the 17th century they were the pioneers as well of the transatlantic trade, the slave trade. Iberian ports such as Lisbon, Seville and Cadiz outfitted 97 percent of the European based slave voyages up to that date carrying nearly 500,000 African captives to the destinations of toil and death in Spanish America. In the early years, captives who had first been brought to Spain from Africa were then put on a ship and sent to the Americas. But as things developed by the 1530s, the trade had shifted its direction and in many cases the Iberian ships sailed first to Africa and then straight to the Americas. Now, 1530s was still the period in which Vasco da Gama was head of the Portuguese presence in India. But the shift had already been made in moving across the Atlantic. Now, in subsequent decades, it was the Dutch who displaced the Portuguese in maritime trade. And the reasons for that we'll look into next time. But largely because they came to dominate the enclave economies. These economies set up on the edges 
not based on territorial conquest, but maritime empires. And we'll look in detail at this, particularly because of the size of Dutch ships. This is the Portuguese caravel, this is the Dutch ships, and the Dutch ship is armed to the teeth. And eventually, in effect, armed with cannons that blow the Portuguese out of the water. So it's that inter-European rivalry that is fascinating to look at in terms of the emergence of a new maritime empire, this time under the Dutch. So next time we'll look in detail at the displacement of the Portuguese by the Dutch, what it then means for the history of European maritime empires, and in turn, what it comes to mean for the mapping of Africa. With a new set of priorities, the Dutch have a new set of interests in the coasts and the interior of large parts of Africa, and they begin to make maps of those. And it's those maps that we're going to use to trace that relationship between Europe and the rest of the world. So, next time tune in and look carefully at this whole question of new maps, new realities. Basically, we're going to be looking at the kinds of maps that come out of that tradition, very different than the earlier royal maps.